causes of back pain and mostly overlooked causes of low back pain, uh, facet pain arthritis and sacroiliac joint. I think uh, my colleagues here agree that we are talking about something like 40% of causes of low back pain. So it is not actually really trivial the problem. Uh, today we are honored to have uh, some esteemed colleagues, uh, Professor Jorn, um, consultant neurosurgeon in uh, Germany, and he is one of uh, our old friends here in uh, Saudi German Hospital. He has been working with us since in, uh, in, in the group, Saudi German Hospital group in Saudi Arabia for 10 years now. Am I right, Professor? Yeah, even more. Yeah, even, more. <laughs> even more than 10 years. So most welcome with us. He will discuss, he will talk with us minimally invasive treatments for uh, facet pain and sacroiliac joint pain. Also, our second speaker is Professor Muhammad Awad, uh, also a neurosurgery consultant in he was here with us in Asir at the beginning, and now he's the, in, uh, in Cairo. Professor Awad is, we, we are considering him the founder of the neurosurgery department here in Asir. Uh, most welcome, Dr. Awad, and he will uh, talk with us today about surgical interventions for sick Thank you, Dr. Ayman. Uh, most welcome. Uh, he will discuss with us uh, surgical interventions for sacroiliac joint pain and for um, facet arthritis. Also, we are uh, welcoming with us Dr. Aisha Al-Hajjaj. She's the neurosurgery consultant and the head of the department in Saudi German Hospital, the MEM. Um, I don't think I'm, she's connected. No, no, I am connected. <laughs> I'm listening to you guys. Well, we, we cannot see you, so welcome Dr. Aisha. Yeah. And uh, um, course, our moderator today is uh, Professor Hassan Jaber. He's the head of the department in Saudi German Hospital, Jeddah. Uh, Professor Jaber is uh, a bit late for us today. He's, he has uh, a very busy clinic in Jeddah, probably. So we are waiting for, his, uh, for him joining us. So, um, let's start with our first talk today, uh, Professor Jordan, um, the mic with you, you can start. Can I start now? Okay. Yes, please. Okay, please. great, thank you. I hope you can hear me. I'm very yes, honored. Yes, we can. To... Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm very honored to have, to have been invited to talk today about a, quite a, seems to be a, quite a trivial topic. But actually, we found in, the, in all those years, or I found in all those years, that it isn't that trivial. It's, it's back pain and the, the treatment of back pain and um, how we can actually optimize that, first in a non-surgical way and maybe also with surgery, if that all doesn't help. I've prepared a little talk to, for my person, just quickly, as, as uh, Dr. Eimann already said, uh, I've been, I'm, a, I'm a neurosurgeon trained in the UK and in uh, Germany and I'm working in Berlin and I have been going to the Saudi hospital group in the, uh, as part of the visiting professor program for many years, I don't even know how many years now, uh, more than 10 I guess. And I've visited a lot of hospitals of the group, Jeddah, Riyadh, Asir, uh, Medina and uh, so on, even Sana'a when it was open. And um, I'd like to talk about um, back pain and treatment options and the systematic approach to this common problem. So I have to see if I can share my talk here. Okay, can you actually see it? Yes, yes, we can see. Right. So I'd like to talk about uh, the minimally invasive treatment of facet-induced and sacroiliac joint pain, SIJ, sacroiliac joint pain. And I've, I'm trying to do this in a, sy a systematic way and, and, and show the approach we have 
here in Berlin and uh, that the approach that we've tried to establish in the uh, Saudi hospital group in uh, the KSA. And I uh, start with talking about, of course now it doesn't work, but okay. Um, Uh, I'd like to give you a quick agenda what I'm talking about. I'd, I'd like to start with a general, a couple of general, com no, general commands, comments about, wait a minute, um, so about um, lumbar facet syndrome. Then I'd like to talk about sacroiliac joint syndromes, and I'd like to give an overview over the uh, radio frequency treatment options for those two. What? We cannot see your screen. Oh, sorry. Um, the presentation is not. That's all right. Is it coming now? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Sorry, it has kicked me out. So um, I'd like, as I said, I'd like to talk about lumbar facet syndrome, sacroiliac joint syndrome, and then about the treatment options, especially about radio frequency treatment, minimally invasive radio frequency treatment, and then about uh, some more complex treatment options. And in specific, uh, in, uh, I'd like especially to talk about uh, simplicity uh, treatment, which is a special way of uh, treating as I'm going to uh, go into that a bit deeper in um, in a couple of minutes, and about uh, endoscopic denervation techniques uh, for lumbar and sacroiliac joint syndromes. And then I'd like to give a couple of uh, lose a couple of words about the thoracic and cervical uh, facet joint syndromes and the treatment of those. So. Um, uh, I don't know why. Okay, lumbar facet syndrome. Um, we all know people coming with low back pain, and um, I don't know why uh, this is automatically going now. Sorry, um, lumbar facet syndrome. Um, patients come, uh, typically present with a a, clin with a, with a non radicular local pain. Um, we have to examine the patients, and we see that. Uh, the patient usually uh, uh, localizes the pain in the lower back, and we specifically have to ask that the pain is if the pain is actually radiating according to the nerve roots. So, if we establish there's a non radicular pain, then uh, it's a good sign or a good uh, hint that we can actually might actually have to deal with the facet syndrome. We can sometimes do a vibration test and see if the pain is is getting worse and localize the area of the uh, pain generator. There are a couple of tests described in the literature. Well, some people do them. I've basically stopped doing those specific tests because they're not really um, that conclusive. And I think the clinical diagnosis of that uh, disease is much more important and much more accurate. We can do some imaging. If you look at the image that's shown on the on the uh, picture now on my, my presentation, you sometimes see an effusion in the facet joints in the T2 image, uh, like on this image here. That is also relatively unspecific, but it can help with uh, uh, establishing a diagnosis. Uh, in general, you see ge unspecific degenerative changes in the majority of our patients with this disease. We have to be careful not to overlook some red flag signs. So as of course we have to see, is there any, um, any sign of inflammation, of infection? Is there any tumor sign? Is there any neurological deficit, which is usually not present in, in facet syndrome? If we have a patient presenting with this, we better have a look and try to figure out why the patient has uh, this neurological deficit. So here, um, again, the diagnostics um, are clinical, as I said, and, um, and we, the, the best test, in my uh, opinion, in my experience, is an infiltration test. So we actually, preferably with x-ray guidance, some people do it with, with ultrasonic guidance, um, 
we do an infiltration of the facet joint area. Preferably, uh, we should actually infiltrate the medial branch of the dorsal branch of the spinal nerve. And um, some people inject into the facet joint, which is possible and, and also gives us uh, some, some prediction whether uh, for the diagnosis and also if the, the following treatment or intervention might be successful. Uh, but it is, in my opinion, much more important or much better to try and not inject directly into the facet joint because if we try and, and, and direct, uh, inject in the area of the medial branch of the dorsal branch of the spinal nerve, we have a much better prediction whether any radiofrequency treatment or any intervention will help because that's what we are attacking when we do this treatment. So there's one thing that I want to point out. If we treat a specific facet joint, we have to actually treat both nerves because a facet joint is actually supply, has a, has a, a, sensor, sens a sensible supply from the lower and upper uh, uh, part of the joint. So we don't only have uh, one branch, we, we have to, to do both branches of the adjacent vertebra uh, that we infiltrate and treat, treat afterwards as well. So, so he, can you actually see my um, arrow here? Anyone? Yeah, can see. Okay, you can see. It. So this is the area that we that, that we will target for the infiltration, but especially for the treatment later infiltration, because we infiltrate uh, not too much of, of a local anesthetic to to see if the patient improves after the injection, and um, uh, that gives us a hint for our uh, that we have a diagnosis of facet syndrome, and we have to use. Uh, one level and then the level below as well, because only then uh, uh, the, the level here, the level above or the level below, um, only then can we make um, um, get an idea about this facet joint here. The best way to figure out where to place the needles is by uh, in the lumbar spine by doing an, a, a 30 degree X-ray oblique X-ray where we can actually see the Scotty Dock sign here, which is the lower part of the facet joint. And this, is, this here is the upper part of the facet joint. The ear of the Scotty Dock or rabbit or whatever you want to call it, um, is, the, uh, is the one part of the facet joint. And our target area is the eye or the neck of the Scotty Dock here or here in the schematic drawing on a model of a spine. Um, so what if we have, when we have this uh, established that our patient has improved uh, after, um, uh, after uh, injection, test injection, we can decide what kind of treatment we want to um, carry out. And um, I, I, let me just lose a couple of words about, about what, before we go into any intervention, of course, there, there should be a, um, a, a plan how these patients have been treated before. Um, that means any patient turning up with the lower back pain should definitely, before we or even offer any injection, denervation, whatever operation, should undergo physiotherapy, pain treatment as of uh, like analgesics. I usually try at least two different uh, peripheral analgesics and um, physiotherapy. Uh, and uh, change of life circumstances, maybe some weight loss, uh, that looking at the patient, talk to the patient and try to do anything uh, that we can do in the conservative um, range. And if that does not help, and if the patient is still not happy and cannot manage the, uh, the pain, and we have determined that we are dealing with the lumbar facet syndrome, we can uh, offer some treatments and I usually start with the radio frequency denervation, which is a very simple and easy treatment to do. It can be done in local anesthesia as a more or less outpatient procedure. I use a, a, a thermocouple probe and uh, we use 80 degrees Celsius for 90 seconds on the treatment points of the uh, facet uh, joints, the one I just showed you before. There are some other um, uh, methods that can be done. Endoscopic radiofrequency denervation is another one. I'm going to talk about it a bit later. 
because I you can't really do this without anesthesia. So I leave that as the second step and usually go for radio frequency denovation with needles uh, in the beginning, because that, as I said, can be done in local anesthetic as an outpatient procedure. Some people do cryodenovation. I don't do this because I don't have the devices. And also, I think when you look at the, um, at the um, literature, the uh, heat, the, the radio frequency denovation, the, 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 the thermal denovation has, in my opinion, better results, but you can talk and discuss about that. But uh, the trial probe would, would actually uh, could do the same we do with heat. Uh, he would do the same with, with cold and um, uh, would have similar results. Um, there's also the possibility of chemical denervation. Some people do this. I do not do this because of, um, of uh, the possibility of complications. There's a lot of, um, that you, you basically inject alcohol or phenol into the, um, uh, area where you want to denervate basically on the facet joint in this case and um, it, it can do some nasty side effects and I do this only in patients who definitely cannot have any radio frequency treatment like um, uh, if they have like a pacemaker make an older model or something like that and um, in this case in these cases you can think about it but I do not advise doing this anymore okay um, um, one word about um, something that, I mean, maybe I don't need to say that here, but I've found that a lot of people do have a problem uh, differentiating between facet injection and periradicular therapy, PRT. And I just want, because I have a lot of patients who come from their doctors and say, oh, I've had my, my injection, what they actually had was a PRT. And I just wanted to point out that the PRT is only to be done in, as the name says, it's a periradicular therapy and you should only do this in a patient who presents with radicular pain, such as in, in lumbar disc disease, for instance. Uh, then you have a, a, a proper radicular pain, then you can do periradicular therapy. Everything else with the, the, the like pseudo radicular pain or, or facet pain, localized back pain, should uh, undergo a facet infiltration, innovation, uh, in, uh, infiltration or denervation, and not a periradicular therapy. Sometimes it makes sense to test it because if, you, if the patient is old or can't really tell you whether the pain is more in the leg or in the, in the back, they, I sometimes do both and see what helps the patient better. But in general, when we talk about facet syndromes, we do not want to do a periradicular therapy. We want to do a facet infiltration and later on a facet denervation. So, um, and that applies for the lumbar and for the uh, uh, cervical area as well. So how do I do it? If you, if the patient has improved uh, with in, after injection, and I always say if the patient, I ask them how much did the pain improve? Because what's improvement? I mean, I, for myself, I've, I've established a system where I say, okay, I do a VAS scale zero to 10, and they should tell me what's the pain before and what's the pain after the, uh, uh, what, what, what rate, what's the rating of the pain after the injection. And if they improve for, uh, to about 50% or better after infiltration, um, I uh, consider this as a successful infiltration and um, I offer the patient the radiofrequency needle denervation. And um, here you can see uh, the setting that I use in my hospital. This is a standard x-ray room. It's a standard, standard C-arm. Uh, patient lays on this table here. Um, you do sterile prepping of the patient. And uh, there's, the, there's the radio frequency generator. This is the x-ray machine uh, control unit and the C-arm. I usually have a nurse with me, <coughs> um, sorry who um, um, operates the uh, um, radio frequency generator. You can do that yourself, then you have to cover it with a sterile draping, uh, but uh, it's always more convenient with a nurse available. Uh, these are the instruments you need, and you can see it is very simple, straightforward, you don't need a lot. 
<coughs> the only thing you need is the generator that which is uh, often supplied by the company who uh, which is actually uh, supplying the uh, uh, radio frequency needles i have a three channel generator there are the newer ones have four channels um, and that's why I usually use three denervation needles. This needle is a special needle which is uh, has a, has an insulation. It, it's about uh, there, there are different lengths. This one is ten centimeters long, uh, I think, and um, and it has a one centimeter active tip. The rest of the needle, which is metal, and the rest of the needle is actually uh, insulated with plastic. So um, you have the needle. You have the inner inner a, a smaller inner needle which you. Uh, remove once the needle is put in place so that black cap is being taken out and you insert this part here this uh, uh, thermocouple needle which is reusable and it, if you handle it well it it, 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 it keeps forever and oh, not forever but but long time and you insert this and connect this to the uh, uh, radio frequency generator um, that's I need a couple of swaps and and a needle and, and, and the uh, injection um, um, fluid which is basically I shall have a picture of that in a minute or pivacaine and the corticoid. So um, that's uh, all you need for the radio frequency treatment. Here again, <coughs> what the, the 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 medication we use I use raw pivacaine two milligrams per milliliter. And uh, triamcinolone, usually 40 milligrams. Have to be careful if patients are diabetic or are um, um, have high blood pressure. Um, I, I sometimes use it a little bit less. Some people use hylase, which is an enzyme. I tend not to use it, but some colleagues do that. Fine, probably works as well. So, um, uh, sorry, next one. Here we see the whole thing in place. The patient is positioned on the X-ray table. Here you see a 30 degree angle of the of the X-ray uh, C arm, and I um, uh, and I uh, have a look at the uh, uh, target area, and uh, I come to this in a minute. A patient is uh, draped sterile, and um, uh, the needles are inserted. In this case, I only use two needles. Normally, I use three. And um, it can be, as I said, it can be operated uh, by one person, but preferably by two. So here again, another view, um, nothing special. And um, here uh, you see um, <clears throat> the uh, my my method. You, as I said before, you can see the Scotty doc here, probably with a little bit of imagination. It just looks the other way in here, and I target the neck area, eye neck area more here. The, this area is the one where I uh, position the um, a needle. Um, there's the other one. It looks a bit different here, but it's basically the same area on that Scotty dock here. And um, here another one. Um, as I said, 30 degree projection, except in level L5 is one. I, in level L5 is one, you do an AP projection. projection. That's the only thing that ha one has to keep in mind, that um, in this level, you have to do an AP x-ray and you, in, you position these needles here. I uh, reposition the needle after um, um, the treatment, which is um, uh, in the end 80 degrees, 90 seconds, but, and I reposition it once per level to cover a little bit of more, a little bit more of an area here to actually hit the nerve, the, the, uh, the uh, sensory nerve ending. <coughs> um, before we do the treatment, you have to do a stimulation, which is in the in the uh, generator. You can you just run the program. It's by it's 50 hertz, one millisecond impulses, uh, and you do a sensory stimulation up to 0.5 volts. Uh, I usually go up to one volt, and you don't want any radicular pain or pain in, in the area of the anus if you lower down. Um, then you do a motor stimulation, uh, the two hertz for one millisecond. And um, you, as a rule of thumb, you can uh, go up to the double of the sensory level when the patient, when the patient felt something. And if there's no motor uh, reaction in the leg, 
then you are basically safe to go and you do your treatment before if you do the treatment without injecting the local anesthetic patients won't like that it's uh, not really funny um, and they it hurts and that's why i always advise to give a little bit of local anesthetic don't give too much because if you in my opinion in my, in my experience if you give too much of the local anesthetic before you start the radiofrequency treatment before you heat up the needle um, the heat dissolves too much and it doesn't work as well so i give a little bit of a treat of, of, of an injection and do two um, uh, treatment points and then i inject a little bit more for the post interventional to treat the post interventional pain <clears throat> okay so now the that's the um, image of the uh, motor stimulation sensory stimulation and the lesion here it, it, it keeps the temperature on its own and now uh, the results that I have actually um, I, I looked at some patients that, that are treated over one year and they were all uh, patients that had radio frequency treatment in the uh, in the way I just described but they all had a lumbar facet syndrome and I looked at patients in roughly a 12 month period. They all had non-radicular pain, a couple of other things that, uh, that needed to be met, like uh, no high grades for the listesis. I guess uh, Dr. Awad will, will talk about that a bit later when, when we go into the, the operative um, uh, treatment, because of course, if there's more than, than a grade one listesis, I always uh, I doubt that the facet infiltration injection denervation will help that much. But you can try it, but uh, sometimes they have to undergo surgery in the end. They don't have this prolapse and so on, prolapse and so on. And important is that they have a history of pain. I mean, there's no point of, of treating a patient with all this stuff if they only had like facet pain for three weeks. I mean, people who have a short term pain should not uh, undergo this kind of treatment. You just give them uh, the, the standard treatment, physiotherapy, analgesics, and so on, and often this pain resolves. Only if it is very constant and very, very, very treatment resistant, that, which means like more than six months of pain, any conservative treatment is ineffective. Um, and, and they didn't have any surgery that explains the pain, we um, uh, can go for the uh, lumbar uh, radio frequency treatment. So here are the results. Uh, I looked at, these were 78 patients, um, so quite a lot. Um, the um, age tends to be, I mean, that's the age range, but um, it tends to be higher age, of course, according to what the patients have this disease, so they are usually older. Um, uh, most patients were seen. I usually have a regimen that, that they turn up six weeks after the intervention, and then I see them every um, uh, couple of, uh, every one and a half to two months afterwards. And so I looked at the results, and, and the positive re result of the treatment was defined as the VAS, the pain scale, was better than, it was 50% or better. So um, after six to eight weeks, about uh, 60 patients, 62 patients uh, were uh, significantly improved. And that went down over the next couple of months. So that after a year, about half of the patients I treated with proven uh, lumbar facet syndrome were still pain-free, which is the result that is also shown. And uh, if you look at the literature, that sort of fits the area. I, I just did it uh, just for fun. I just asked the patients what they actually repeat the treatment if um, when, when, when they actually had uh, recurring pain. And it was quite interesting that um, in the end, um, and in the beginning, the, the, the patients that had rebound uh, pain uh, quite early, so after a couple of weeks or even days, uh, because they're all in here, um, only 12% would repeat the treatment. Um, and the longer you waited, the higher the number of patients who would actually undergo the same treatment again, especially here. If they were pain-free for a year, they would say, well, I would do it again, because um, it's relatively uh, straightforward and, um, um, and the, the complications are very, very low.
So there's so much to the lumbar facet uh, syndromes. Now I'd like to talk about the sacroiliac joint syndrome. Just a couple of uh, uh, facts about this disease. It's basically a similar disease as, as such, and um, but but it's, it's under sacroiliac joint, as the name says. 80%, 18% of the adult population does suffer from uh, lower back pain at some point, and and 20% um, uh, of this low back pain is usually um, statistically from the sacroiliac joint. I found that in a couple of uh, publications. And of, in this area, the conservative treatment is often insufficient. So they, um, there are much more patients who turn up, in my experience, who turn up with sacroiliac joint uh, uh, problems who want uh, a further treatment like a radio frequency denervation. So for diagnostics, the tests that are often described, like a Minnell test, where you, where you pull the leg up and overextend it, and, and spine tests and so on, they're often not really too clear in their, in my opinion, in, in their um, uh, uh, results. And, and you can't really rely on those tests, in my uh, opinion, of, of all these years. Um, it, it's again the clinical presentation. They, the patients have pain in the sacroiliac joint a area. Sometimes they have pseudo radicular pain. That seems to be much more in patients with, with sacroiliac joint syndrome than it is with lumbar facet syndrome for some reason. Imaging. Imaging, in my opinion, is not very useful. Most a lot of patients turn up with an MRI scan of the of this sacroiliac joint. I mean, you do have to do some imaging often because you want to know if there's any other dis underlying disease that presents like this. But like it can be a tumor, can be some uh, high grade uh, listhesis, for instance. But, but I speak here about a sac a, a sacral MRIs and I stopped doing them because I often have patients who come with an with a clear clinical sacroiliac joint syndrome, and you look at the images and you don't really see anything out of the ordinary in the, sac uh, in the sacral and sacroiliac joint area on, the, on that specific MRI and uh, the other way around. So I usually don't do this anymore. So um, <clears throat> again, the test injection for these patients is crucial. So again, I use, for the test injection, I use ropivacaine, Two, same dose, two milligrams per milliliter, and some triamcinolone. And you can do an intra-articular injection, which is sometimes very difficult to achieve, because often people have like a lot of degenerative changes, and and you need an X-ray for that usually to get into the joint, and you have to use quite a lot of of, of pressure to to inject. So I think the and also to predict the the result of our treatment afterwards, and it's external. Uh, uh, an, an injection in the area between the, the um, uh, foramina on the sacrum and the sacroiliac joint is much more predictable for the, uh, the success of our um, uh, treatment. So here, this is, this is just a quick anatomy image. Um, the problem is, of course, there are also nerve endings going here ventrally which we can't reach, of course. So that is the problem why a lot of patients uh, or some patients do not improve. Uh, so, but here, this is the backside. And what I mean is you, in, you inject and also treat later on uh, this area where my arrow is now. You go, don't go straight into the joint. You can do that, but as I said, uh, difficult to do a radio frequency treatment there. So what you do is you do a, like a line where you do radio frequency treatment here. And you, you also must uh, never forget uh, to treat the S1, the L5 as one joint, at least the lower part of it, because there's a branch, uh, um, a, a nerve branch going from here this way all the way to the sacroiliac joint. So this is where the um, uh, where our, our treatment injection should be, and also later the treatment. So. Here again, um, the, um, the again you can use needles. The common treatment you position needles, and it's a bit difficult because if you have more than six millimeters with, with a one centimeter needle, it, it, you have a problem sometimes that uh, if the nerve 
are in here, then you wouldn't wouldn't have a good effect. So so they should sort of have a flowing. Uh, the the denervation area should be like uh, like a line, uh, like like here, so that the needles sort of interconnect with the denervation area. So you have to do multiple points, and of course you can already see that it is quite difficult to in, to do this on the sacroiliac joint because you have to do a lot of inj injection points, a lot of uh, uh, denervation points when you do the radio frequency uh, treatments. So, but um, if you do the same setting as the as before, the same uh, when, when I showed the images, the same setting, and just lower. And I showed you where the, where the red dots were before. That's where I positioned the needles. And I looked at all my patients who I treated um, uh, over a twelve month period, and um, they. Um, uh, the, the results are as follows, 80 patients here, um, and roughly it's, it's similar to what we saw before with the lumbar, um, with the lumbar area, um, about after 12 man months, about 50% of patients were still pain-free. So here, this is the patients who would actually repeat the, procedures after, uh, the procedure after a rebound, that's much lower. But that's because it's much more uh, cumbersome and much more painful on the, sacra on the sacroiliac joint to have that needle treatment. And so a lot of patients, or more, more patients, don't uh, uh, want to do this again. So um, <clears throat> here, uh, if the patients who have not improved come back to you and say, oh, I, I want something else that hasn't helped, there are two methods I uh, have on offer. And I want to talk about them quickly. One is the so-called simplicity probe. This is a special radio frequency probe. It looks like this here. It has a connector here and there's a long, uh, has a long uh, um, uh, uh, plastic um, uh, needle with three different separate um, metal um, um, areas and, uh, and an extra electrode on the top, which is, which is also um, um, sharp. So you inject, you do a little um, uh, incision and you position the, this needle just in between the uh, foramina and the sacroiliac joint until it lays just in the area where you actually position your normal uh, needles in the pr procedure that I've described before. And you can uh, do the same here, but with a much more efficient, in a much more efficient way, um, <clears throat> because you have definitely overlapping radio frequency um, lesions. Um, <clears throat> here you can see on a piece of chicken, <clears throat> what happens when you, when you um, uh, use that electrode, so you do have a long uh, stripe of, of, of um, um, denervation area, that's where the heat was. Okay, um, that, so this is how I do it. You insert the needle patient is under general anesthetic and that's the, one of the differences uh, with this procedure. You can do it in local, but patients do not like that. It's very painful when you do this in local anesthesia, so you should have patient uh, under GA and um, <clears throat> sleep on the table and they prefer that, they prefer that. Um, here, this is the position of the needle, there is another pro projection and um, so here, another projection is just between the foramina of the sacrum and the sacroiliac joint laying on there. Here, another one. And you do the treatment, which is usually seven minutes in total, and uh, seven and a half minutes. And um, it, it, there's an automatic uh, um, uh, treatment protocol that goes through. So um, here, again, that's where the needle is positioned. And do not forget to denervate the uh, uh, branch uh, and the level F of uh, 5 is 1 here, because that is also um, needs to be treated for the sacroiliac joint uh, syndrome. Here, <clears throat> uh, some um, uh, literature simplicity. We can just look that up if you want. Um, uh, there are a couple of, of publications about it, and the um, but this one doesn't say how many patients got better. They just talked about the uh, um, effect as such. And here you can see about 70 patients after six weeks, and, and only 15 patients after uh, uh, 12 months got better with this treatment. But don't forget, these are the patients who have already failed had failed uh, uh, minimally invasive needle treatment. Okay, so then here my patients 
I looked at all the patients from 2017, um, and um, they um, were, there were 30 patients, and um, here roughly similar results to the literature. Um, first, it works quite well, and then after half a year or a year, it goes down to around 20% in my patients. And, um, and um, here, the interesting thing is that um, the patient who would repeat the procedure, the, the percentage of those is much, much higher. And that's, I think, because they are asleep and they don't have any procedure-related pain during the surgery. And afterwards, they do have pain, and that's why you have to infiltrate the area where you did the radio frequency treatment with the simplicity probe um, um, thoroughly. So then um, other methods um, than simplicity. The problem with simplicity is it is very expensive. So um, you're, I was lucky to be able to use it for a long time. And then my uh, hospital said, uh, this is not worth doing it because we pay more than we actually earn. So, so it is very problematic. The, the, the probe is very expensive. So I was looking for a different system and I found those two. And I did uh, for a while the rotor capsulation. I don't want to go into this. This is like, it looks like a gun and you do like an incision and you uh, go into on, directly onto the facet joint. And there is a, on the tip of this little thing here, there's a, there's a heating electrode and it rotates and cuts the, the, the facet joint uh, capsule and um, it work, but um, I don't have that many patients and then the, the company couldn't deliver the device anymore. So I don't know whether they're still available, but I stopped using them. But then I uh, started using this, the endoscopy system. And that is quite an interesting approach because I personally always thought, oh, this is never going to work because because uh, how can you actually see endoscopically on, an, on a facet joint? But then if you actually do it, you can see quite nicely the endoscope, uh, the, the, the facet joint here and use a, you actually look at the joint and you can use an electrode and just go around the joint and, and try and denervate all those nerves under vision. You don't really see the nerves, but you can see the joint properly and you have a much better range of freedom to do the treatment. And this is exactly what it's like. This is exactly how it looks there. You can use monopolar probes, you can use bipolar probes for people with like uh, pacemakers, for instance. And you, but the only thing is it's quite expensive to buy the whole thing. But um, um, we get into that in a minute. Uh, here are some, some um, uh, publications, quite a lot of publications uh, available now about this method and about the results. I, I want to show you my results, but first to the technique. You um, uh, do a, a, an incision and you introduce a trocar uh, under x-ray control, so you can actually see the facet joint. You can, the good thing is you can use this for the lumbar facet and also for the sacroiliac joint. And um, so this method, uh, this, this device can be used for both of them. And, uh, and you can under vision do the radio frequency treatment. The whole thing takes about 15 minutes when you're, when you're um, uh, trained and um, have done a couple and uh, the results are quite good. So here, um, what you need is what you need. You need an endoscope. And this is actually as the company advertises what, what you need. These are the trocars. These are some forceps and stuff. And here's the endoscope. This is your working channel. And these are the electrodes. <clears throat> I have found that you don't really need all of this. So I basically only uh, acquired a, a couple of probes, three of them. I acquired a working channel and an endoscope and the electrodes and one of those um, 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 uh, kerosens just uh, to in case I need to get a specimen and uh, use the endoscope for that as well. That's all I bought, and that reduces the uh, the price of the whole thing substantially, and you can do everything with it. Here, uh, an image of how it works. The patient is asleep. You have to position him on the X-ray table, slightly uh, bent, and um, it should be. I use a carbon table because of the X-ray uh, better vision but you can use any table basically. <clears throat> and um, here's the X the C arm, a proper covering. Be careful to put some backs on the side because you have to do irrigation. You have to use irrigation. And uh, the one thing that is very important is if you use a monopolar, you have to use a, a, a sugary 
uh, irrigation and not saline for bipolar so use saline. Here you see uh, the, there's the, the uh, trocar and um, the endoscope, there's the irrigation and I put the electrode in and under vision on an x-ray uh, on the, on the um, uh, endoscopy screen, I can actually do this procedure. I, I um, show here a couple of, of images where the um, um, uh, endoscope is positioned. This is again five as one that needs to be done as well. And then you can go, these are the, the, the foramina. This is the sacroiliac joint and you stay between here, uh, between the foramina and the sacroiliac joint. And you can actually really go in and I usually do for one side sacroiliac joint, I do one, uh, I, I do two in, in small uh, half a centimeter incisions, one here for, for the sacroiliac, uh, for, the, for the joint L5 is one, and the upper part of the sacrum and the, the other one for the lower part and the lower two thirds of the sacrum, and I do the uh, denervation easily. Again, takes about 15 minutes. This is the setting of the <clears throat> operating this table. You have the, the light cable, the electrodes, the endoscope, and uh, the, uh, this is a bipolar electrode. This is a monopolar e electrode, which is a, a single use product. That's basically the only single use product you need. And uh, this one you don't need very often, only in special cases. And I have one that, that is um, from, uh, from a gynecological tray. And here you have the endoscope, the trocar, and the uh, uh, trocars here, the working channel. And uh, to close, you need this. Um, here, this is the setting, the arm, the, the, the surgeon, the nurse, the anesthetist, and um, there's the endoscope. Here are the results. Again, all patients, <clears throat> similar to um, the, the one I showed you before. I don't want to go into this. It's the same, basically. And here are my results. Um, all patients had previous needle denervation. And if you look at the lumbar patients with lumbar facet uh, syndromes, um, I, this is, I have another point in time, 10 days, because this is when I take out the stitches, so I could ask them how they're doing. And you can see about 50% are pain-free after a year. Um, um, and these are the 50, pay, this is only 50% of the patients who have not benefited from the needle treatment before. And here, these are the sacroiliac joint patients, um, roughly the same numbers. Um, here, I, this are, was 68, uh, 86 patients that I treated. Uh, number was 35. Interesting. Much more, many more patients uh, come with the sacroiliac joint syndrome for the treatment. So um, now to compare the results again is uh, for lumbar facet syndrome. If you compare the uh, results uh, of, after needle um, uh, radiofrequency treatment and endoscopic, not many patients, but, but endoscopic um, uh, treatment. So you can say 50% of your patients, of all your patients get, get basically statistic, uh, roughly better after needle treatment. And the rest of them uh, who don't get better, you can offer the other method, the endoscopic method. And of those about half uh, still get an improvement. So you have roughly about 75 patients, a percent of patients who get better after the... Uh, yes, sir, I'm nearly done. Yeah, yeah. We are out of time almost, so... I'm nearly done, Ayman. <laughs> and so this Thank is you. the, this is the um, uh, sacroiliac joint patients. Um, same thing. And uh, after 12, if you compare all three methods, sorry, I have to compare all three methods. You can uh, see that the needle treatment gets you about 50% of your patient better. The simplicity, uh, about 20% more, and uh, endoscopic much better, much more. So, um, so my treatment flow, and that's what I would suggest. First, you treat your patients with analgesics. Then you do a test injection. Then you do a radio frequency needle denervation, and then you decide which one you want to do. Simplicity, the uh, uh, more invasive uh, denervation, or you do the endoscopic. The pro of the simplicity is you can theoretically do it in local anesthesia, but not advisable, and um, it is very expensive. That's a negative. And the endoscopic denervation it is not so expensive once you've acquired the material, and, um, and you have a higher success rate.
Yeah, so um, last two things, last two uh, images. So you can do this for cervical facet syndrome as well. I, um, you have, one has to be aware that the uh, area, the target areas are slightly different. So you, you have a different target point for, for cervical facet syndrome. This is not the topic today so much. So I'm, 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 because of the time restrict, restrictions, I don't want to go into this too much. You can do this uh, again, the same method uh, with 80, 80 degrees for, for a minute, or um, I use this uh, pulse uh, denervation. This is the uh, uh, point of um, um, denervation. And the last thing is the thoracic facet syndrome. You can also do it here. And here you have to be very careful because you need more points than in the lumbar area where I only use two. In the thoracic, I usually use five or six in one level. And uh, because it's much more, there's much more variation in the um, um, location. And um, that's it. Thank you. Well, we all thank look you. like that. And I just have to get this off. Yes. No, it's already off, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit long, but I hope it wasn't too boring. <laughs> we enjoyed it. Yeah, that was a very interesting, very interesting presentation. Um, Okay, where we will uh, take the, the second talk and then we will open the discussion with our audience. So may I introduce Professor Awad, neurosurgery consultant, and he will discuss with us the surgical options for the same problem, sacroiliac and facet syndromes, minimally invasive spine surgery. Uh, thank you all for inviting me for this session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for my old friend, uh, Professor Ayman Hafiz. Dr. Ayman Hafiz is my mentor, actually. He is my senior for many years. I started residency on his hands. And also, I enjoyed working with Jordan for maybe more than 10 years now. And uh, I would like to welcome you to all. Uh, I will have very small topic just to continue the topic of the uh, fast session to give the patients and our uh, students that is wide scope or the complete uh, view of the treatment options for any patient who has uh, facet or sacroiliac syndrome. I have no disclosures. It's very painful to us and to the patient when we treat pain. If you have a fracture, then simply you fix the fracture. The outcome is uh, known and seen and you can confirm it by images. Sometimes if you have tumor, you can take it out and you show the picture to the patient that no more tumor. But for pain, it's very difficult to convince the patient that his pains are better. And you, it's very difficult to assess, uh, usually indirectly, that the patient recovered if they resume back activities uh, normally. So again, uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Jorn, the facet syndromes, and I insist about the uh, terminology of syndromes uh, because uh, the facet syndrome has be, has must must be separated from other causes of back pain. It uh, has a clear definition. Then we have to analyze the patient complaint and the patient uh, data and the patient uh, examination to make sure that part of his pain is related to the facet or sacroiliac joint and what part of his pain is not related. So when we offer him treatment, we know in uh, short, uh, beforehand that how much he is going to improve. And again, we must confirm. Uh, usually the facet pathology and sacroiliac pathology, we get uh, negative images. And this is a big problem because if you did any maneuver to the patient and the patient went in troubles, he has reports that everything is normal. This will be against you. The same side, if you need to treat this patient under insurance, you have to send the medical report that support your diagnosis and usually uh, the, the, the imaging reports are uh, uh, reported free or no significant uh, finding. And again, to get approval for this patient will be quite difficult. So we need to confirm first by clinical examination, by radiology, we see morphological change, we see signal change on MRI. And most important I like to do is the uh, uh, therapeutic blocks. If the patient gets relieved, this is 100% sure that you will improve from other procedure to be done. 
Uh, for facets, we have osteoarthritis pathology. This is a major pathology we're treating. And also we have other pathologies leads to morphological change and mass lesions like osteophytosis, tumors, infection, and trauma. And these settings will consider other uh, routes of uh, management. The pain management comes uh, first. However, other options may be needed. For facet anatomic lesions, we could maybe, as I said, tumors, cysts, or fractures. Then at this time, if the non-invasive procedures fail to control the patient, or I need to remove the mechanically disease the facet, then we can go for many uh, techniques uh, to decompress these facets. We have the uh, MIS tubular retractor system. We can use endoscopes. We can use indirect uh, facet uh, decompressions when we do discectomies with motion preservation, as we can see here in artificial disc uh, insertion. This indirectly disengage the facets and it may improve any uh, facet related uh, foraminal compression. At the same time, we can do the microscopic surgery. And again, this is more uh, radical decompression for the neural elements. Then we add uh, cages or maybe plating. And again, this indirectly may help to decompress uh, the foramina and uh, subsequently uh, relieve any facet related uh, problems. So again, the, 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 the techniques are all done to trying to eliminate the pathology at the same time, minimize the morbidity. And the idea of pain therapy in general is obviating the pains without suffering the patient into uh, uh, surgery or long hospital stay. This is the, the, the philosophy of the pain uh, therapy, I th think, in my opinion. And this can be achieved also by surgical methods if the conservative or the radio frequency or the non-interventional methods fail, then we have other options. Uh, <clears throat> as the surgeons, we like to put screws everywhere. So even the facet, we have facet screws for some indication. As we can see here, this is facet screw is done part of early lumbar fixation for one patient. And I, I think hardly you can see the screw here. So the, for some pathologies related to the facet morphology or facet dislocations, I can use an instrumentation. And when we talk about an instrumentation, we may need to all sometimes remove the facets, either microsurgically or endoscopy or endoscopic techniques. And some people like the dynamic stabilization, the motion preservation. And from this era, we find in the literature that some people think about facet prosthesis or total facet arthroplasty, and there is a lot of negotiation about these issues. So we have to think in a combined work for combined approach and use combined tools and use different uh, diagnostic and intervention uh, uh, modalities. And even if you can see here, the ultrasound is now having a role trying to minimize radiation to both patient and the physician. And I think Dr. Ayman has a quite experience in these issues. But again, the minimal invasive techniques or the non-invasive techniques are, are usually costly. For the sacroiliac syndromes, again, the most common sacroiliac syndrome is the osteoarthritis. Then uh, as a spine surgeon, we see a lot of trauma with sacroiliac problems, but sometimes we see tumors. And sometimes we see infection to the sacroiliac joint, especially nowadays after many people doing sacroiliac injection, we started to see uh, sepsis in the sacroiliac joint with prevertebral abscess or pelvic abscess that might need to be drained either by us I, or by the general surgeon. For the sacroiliac joint, if you think about surgery, you must have the definition of refractory intolerable sacroiliac pains for at least six months. Because surgery is usually not that uh, optimistic to the patients, and the patient may develop more pains after operation if this patient are not well uh, done or not well uh, chosen carefully. And sacroiliac fusion is well known for trauma patients. Uh, and we can do it through both the open techniques and also in the uh, minimal invasive techniques. Open techniques usually be done with other sacral or, other sacral or pelvic fractures. In these settings, you can do sacroiliac fusion. We have the cheap techniques and sophisticated techniques. As we can see, this is a 
case of double spine fracture, we have a pelvic fracture. We did for this patient uh, lumbo, uh, iliac or iliolumbar fixation and indirectly we help it to uh, fuse the uh, distracted or diastasis of the sacroiliac joint. This is an open technique. We use very cheap uh, rod uh, bending maneuver. This is very cheap, no need for sophisticated. But in some cases we need a sophisticated uh, approaches and we use sophisticated system. And this is dedicated set for uh, iliac bone screwing, and we can use it for the trans uh, iliac or trans sacral iliac screw again for lumbosacral fixation. And as we see here, this contralateral uh, sacral screw. The most recent things now are the uh, sacral iliac percutaneous techniques, and basically, these techniques uh, depend on uh, having or traversing the sacral iliac joint by uh, a metal that allow incorporation. To bone, either the metal or the uh, uh, implant is fenestrated, as we can see in this picture, or uh, uh, yeah, printed by the 3D technology uh, from a special alloy that helps this uh, implant to be integrated. Because the pseudo fusion in these joints, the joint is complex, and you know this is non uh, synovial joints and complex and have very whole load uh, sharing. So, uh, proper fusion must be achieved, as you can see, the three uh, pillar, uh, 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 three pillar uh, technique is more uh, important than the single screw where the rotation movements are less. So in general, uh, we have to know that we must think about the patient as a combined approach. We define actually where is the pathology and how much is his pain related to uh, the, 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 the spine or the facet or the sacroiliac joints. If the patient has, for example, uh, spondylosis L4-5, uh, then I operate the patient, then post if I have some sacroiliac pains, either from the surgery or they are missed in the diagnosis preoperatively. Again, we have to understand the expectation for every patient and how much pain uh, is going to be relieved by our maneuvers, whether it's a pain uh, intervention therapy or the surgical techniques. And again, the minimal invasive techniques is uh, trying to uh, shorten the gap between the uh, image guided spine interventions and the open techniques, trying to get better outcome for uh, resistant cases at the same time, decrease the morbidity. Uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me. I think this is, will be uh, enough for me for this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awad, for the interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are now open to some uh, questions. If we have a question on the Q&A list. Um, OK, I don't, I don't think we have uh, lots of questions. Dr. There was, Aisha. There was one, Ayman, if I can. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, there was one, I, I've answered that on the um, uh, online thing. There was one asking about cooled uh, radio frequency uh, treatment. Uh, just uh, maybe people have heard about that. I've, I have not that much experience with it. I'm actually, in fact, starting properly this week, this coming week. With it, but um, I have seen a couple of patients that was quite. Uh, satisfied with the treatment they have a better distribution of heat i don't i haven't got any any results yet but the problem is the um, it, it's a promising uh, a method but um, i don't know yet because it seems to be quite expensive and uh, that that leads me to another question that i just saw about the insurance coverage of the uh, uh, procedures and as dr Watt said the, the the operations are usually um, um, that, that is from an insurance point, that is usually straightforward because uh, if people hand in an, a, a request for an operation, um, um, they are often uh, approved because the insurance people can uh, 
handle that or can imagine what we're actually doing there when we operate. But if you go in with the, with the pain <laughs> therapy treatment and, and some minimally invasive treatment or endoscopy treatment for pain on the back and uh, or neck or whatever, uh, they often uh, give you problems. So uh, I have a, a it is very difficult. You have to really explain to them what you're doing, be really specific, show them uh, the results from the literature that uh, uh, that this actually does work. And uh, and in the end, it is much more expensive for the for the insurance to pay uh, the, uh, the the for, for the painkillers for the and 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 the, the loss of work time of the patient. Uh, and it, you know, it's, it's much more expensive in the end. Uh, to have uh, uh, to, to treat the patient without any intervention so uh, it's a big problem especially here in germany it's really a big problem to get the insurance pay for it and they let you sometimes you have to ad admit the patient overnight and what we do is we often do like a, a, a combined pain treatment so we admit the patient for one or two days and we do like a, an, an injection and, and and speech therapy and physiotherapy and the treatment and then it works also with the insurance um, okay any any more questions have have input yeah sure uh, when we are discussing the uh, cost for the insurance companies and for hospitals and try to convince people to do uh, the minimal invasive uh, approaches, usually in the second day, we ask them for very expensive equipment. The mm -hmm. C-arms, the fluoroscopy, the RF machines, the endoscopy, all these things. So, uh, yes, the patient may come for to do an outpatient procedure, but maybe on the other hand, uh, Hospitals and the insurance will think about millions of dollar investment uh, in the equipment needed to uh, solve the issue of the highly demanding or increasing cost of the uh, technology needed to do uh, these or even the MIS techniques. Well, I, I have actually, I've been through this process with the endoscopy, for instance, and I, um, I, I nearly gave up because they just didn't want to do it because of exactly that, that issue. They saw how much the system costs. But then what I've done was I went to the, to the administration of the hospital and actually took the figures with me, the numbers, and said, OK, look, you, you pay let's say whatever, 10,000 euros for the equipment. That's a one-off payment. And you have recurrent costs of 100 euros per patient. So, and then you get for this treatment, whatever it is. And in the end, if you show them that you actually can uh, generate um, a, an income for the hospital, then the hospital is on your side. And they, after I showed him the, uh, the calculation, which I did myself and, and, and did, does work now. I've been doing it for about two years now. Um, they bought the, the system and uh, and now they're happy they have it. And it's the same with the radio frequency thing, of course, because you need the generator. But and the generator is about what I don't know, twenty thousand euros. But if you talk to the company, if you want to do this really, and then you talk to the company and say, "Well, I've got so and so many patients, and I I will use the method. I need your uh, I, I will need the needles." but I want you to, uh, to support me by giving me the, the generator or at least give it uh, much cheaper, that they usually do that. And, and so far, whenever I've done this uh, in any hospital I've worked in, so far, there was always a way to do it. And uh, so everybody was happy. So, but the problem is people don't know. They just see, oh my God, you have to pay so and so much. And then they say no. And, and if you give them the numbers, that's fine. And surgery is, of course, I mean, about, I'm completely, I agree, it's cl clear that we take people to surgery, the hospital earns the most money. But but the thing is, is that always the best as, as a start? And I completely agree that there are, there are cases where you have to do surgery, especially trauma. I mean, yes, of course. I mean, what, you have to fix the sacroiliac joint. And then exactly that um, uh, side bone, what you showed at the end, the three um, uh, screws, um, uh, so there's a very good system, minimally invasive system, quite nice to do, but um, 
but I think we should always have a, a procedure and say we start with the less invasive stuff first and we, we filter the patients out that are not benefiting from, from this. And then you've got a couple of patients and then you can go. And also, if it doesn't help, they cannot tell you afterwards or you haven't tried anything else. And the other thing I'd like to say is about the injection, that, uh, the, the infection. Um, that's, that's true. But I have to say, um, a lot of people do injections and we do see a higher rate of, uh, of infection. Uh, after lumbar and cervical injections, especially after lumbar injections, sacroiliac injections. Uh, the problem is, if you do this properly, and if you do a proper prepping, like in an OR-like setting for this treatment, I personally, I had in the last, I think in the last two years, I had one patient, one single patient who had, a, had an infection. I mean, I don't know if it, it, it I treated it uh, with antibiotics and he recovered, but that was the only patient, one single patient. But I, I'm rigorous with the prepping and, and disinfecting, and they, I usually do it in the OR or in an X-ray room that has OR standards uh, with full gear and all that. I'm on. Um, we, we have uh, Dr. Aisha from uh, the MEM, the neurosurgery consultant from the MEM. Dr. Aisha, uh, can we uh, have your input about this presentation, the, these two presentations, please? Dr. Aisha, are you still with us? Hello, Dr. Raiman. Sorry, I'm, uh, I had a, pr a problem with the connection. Uh, Dr. John and Dr. Awad, uh, thank you very much for the uh, 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 very concise uh, presentation. Um, as you know, uh, we see uh, almost, uh, I could say, maybe 70%, sometimes even more of our daily uh, clinic visit goes to elderly people with chronic pains. And uh, a lot of them, they have uh, an element of facet uh, problem. So uh, most of these elderly people, usually they don't like any interventions uh, right away. So you talked a little bit about patient selection, especially as you know, as in private practice, to have the insurance companies provide um, an uh, yani approval for a non-standard, you know, still until now, facet uh, radio frequency um, is not the, you know, like uh, they are not used to it, not all insurance companies at least. So what is your approach for um, an elderly patient who comes probably seen so many GPs, so many physiotherapy, uh, but he comes to your clinic uh, the first time to your clinic uh, what would be your, um, you know, the way you work up the patient so you can make sure when you put him down for radio frequency, he will be approved by the insurance companies. Well, let me say something about this. I, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm sure this is completely different in every single country. And even, I mean, here in Germany, it's even different to where your city is. So the states yeah. of Germany have different ru uh, rules. And, but what, what I found is always very helpful is, first, you have to have a systematic approach. Document that you have actually done things. P put down in writing what the patient has, how long the pain was, what has been done to find out whether this is the right pain, what treatment had the, pay, had the patient had. Have the, has the patient had. Uh, did you have physiotherapy, uh, analgesics, and so on? And then you should, you should, when you do the, the the injection, you should document exactly how the pain improved. Because here, the only times I my patients were rejected was when when I couldn't prove 
in writing, because here we have a system, you do the procedure, and then they reject it afterwards, which is even worse than in, in, the, in the KSA, because, because you do something, and if you're unlucky, <laughs> they just don't pay it, and then you have to go into them and kill them, and no, not kill them, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think I, then the that. hospital will charge I, this for you. <laughs> I, I think that uh, for, for the insurance uh, problem here in Saudi Arabia, we both me, both me and Dr. Aisha now are working in uh, Saudi Arabia. So I think the, 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 the approach that I usually that I use and it usually works here that we obtaining approval for a test block is quite easy here for most companies. I don't get a problem for this. So the, doing the test block, um, will provide you with a proof that if the patient improves, then you already have a proof that this treatment works, and then you can go for the for the radio frequency. So it is very important first, as everybody said, that we have to document what what is going on. We have to document the progress of the disease. We have to document failure of medical treatment, failure failure of other conservative measures, and then you can obtain treatment. Um, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not really interested in. Uh, I mean, just the convincing of the uh, insurance approval. What I mean is the progression of patient care. Uh, obviously, you know, by the time they come to you, they have gone through a lot. But it is the first time you see them. So how do you at least work them up in your head? Uh, so eventually, at the end of the road, you will take them to radio frequency. It's a big Pro problem. proper history taking. Proper history taking. This is the. I think this is the cornerstone of the whole thing for the diagnosis, and to decide what is your next step. Because if you get a patient who was not put on medical treatment, then there is no point in doing radio frequency. You have to start with medical treatment. If you have a patient that comes to your clinic and telling you that I have been on uh, drugs for the past five or six years, then it is quite logic to tell him that the next step, if the drugs are not working, we do something else. If th That's it. But the most important thing, I think, is that we have uh, to, uh, to, to put the for patient... For me, uh, actually, uh, for me, uh, Dr. Ayman, usually, um, you know, these kind of patients, they come with a long uh, list of uh, complaints. So uh, what yeah. I do, I work with the patient and we put a priority list and I tell the patient, what is your worst pain? And then what's your next worst pain? And then what's your next worst pain? And then after we compartmentalize the pains into categories, uh, we start working uh, conservatively on each category of the pain. Obviously, because I think it's part also uh, for the patient psych himself or herself that um, part of response to the treatment is to um, separate different types of treatment. For example, if they come with knee pain and then back pain and, you know, the knee is more painful for him than his back, no matter what you do for the back, he will always say you did not... Uh, help me much because I still have the knee pain. So uh, I find it always because, you know, they don't come to you only with facet pain. They come to you usually with the complex pains everywhere. So my point was, um, my point was is again to work the diagnosis from uh, the beginning, you find what uh, are the most pain generators, you prioritize, and then uh, you work the patient up, obviously, according to his priorities. And afterwards, probably, you know, radio frequency, if you and the patient came to the conclusion that is his worst pain. Um, my comment is simply for, you know, the uh, participants, um, is that pain is, is very complex. And, uh, you know, finding the main painful site for the patient sometimes is not easy. That's, that's correct. I completely agree. It is sometimes very difficult to extract what actually is the main 
problem of the patient. And therefore, I, I completely agree. You have to, you have to, what I do is when patients come in, as a, they start, I'm, I've got pain here in the neck, I've got pain in the back and the knee and in the elbow. And they jump from one thing to the other and you have to focus them and say, okay, tell me, what is your biggest problem? And then you start from there. That's what I do. And that's probably what you just said. Um, and, and I would, would agree, completely agree to do it like this. You, you go, you work your way through and you have to, to crystallize what's the main problem of the patient. But have, and then you have to, I never believe, they all come up and say, oh, I have, I've had an injection and it doesn't help. It didn't help. And I had this and that, and it didn't help. I always do it again myself, unless they come from someone that I know that he's following basically the same concept as I. And, and, and that's, I think it's very important. There are patients also that, that you will never get pain free. I mean, that's the other thing. You can never expect to, to, to be able to treat everybody um, in a way that they benefit and they will just, I mean, some people just have such a somatization of their pain. They have a whole body pain and you will never find out any area that, that, that can be treated and improves the patient. Because if you have done it in, in, the, in the back, they turn up with the neck or it's just, uh, and sometimes you have, I even say to patients, you know, I can't help you anymore. That is, I think, completely reasonable sometimes and then they have to go to a, to a general pain specialist and um, and then in this case I don't even start with my with my injections I totally agree to dr. Jordan uh, last statements about we are not pushed or, or not obliged to treat patient pain we choose the pain that we can treat and uh, this is of course end up by less frustration to you as a physician and to the patient as well because usually patients have too much expectation for whatever maneuver you will do, that everything will be fine after that. But actually, when some of these pains are relieved, you will not look to this part and you will look to the residual pains. And still, this patient will keep complaining. So I choose the patient who get benefit uh, from their technique. But again, this is a very big window to recruit patient. I worked in Saudi Arabia for 10 years or more. And I think this approach helped a lot in uh, getting more and more patients to these techniques and even to surgery. Uh, the problem comes in the first in the payment and the financial issues and to ensure the companies and send the approvals and the patient have a, too much cycles within the hospital until the approval, approval rejected, the patient get frustrated. So I used to offer them very small uh, package for the test block because actually this is very cheap one ampoule of uh, dibumidrol, uh, too much cheap, and some syringes. Then uh, you have a uh, minimum charge for the uh, OR. Then this patient, when get relieved of his pain, even if you couldn't get uh, approval for the radio frequency, he will come and pay for the record radio frequency later on because he was convinced by the result from the start. And if this patient did not improve, then you saved yourself doing a definitive procedure for patients who might not get benefit. And again, this will not be good for the our practice or reputation in the area. So it's a double-ended uh, uh, arrow. So you have to balance the, 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 the thing, the economy, the social expectation, and of course, uh, on the top is the medical guidelines. Yes, and, and what you just said is I completely agree with this because to this because in, in my hospital when I came up with, with these methods and wanted to do them, they said, Oh, why should we do? The thing is, you generate if you have a, a well run pain clinic, you generate a lot of patients that come to you and and haven't got anything wrong with their facets, for instance, or but they come with spondylolisthesis, or they come with with uh, lumbar disc, spinal stenosis, that kind of thing. A lot of patients come for second opinion and, and they, they say, oh, I'd like to go for, I've got back pain, but I also have stenosis and that's common. And, and you do the treatment first or you try to, to help them and then you realize, well, it's not really going anywhere and you can offer some surgery. And, and for the hospital, of course, from an economical 
point, this is of course, of course quite interesting because they generate a lot of, of, of patients that are potential customers for surgery. And if you, if you present it to the hospital administration like this, then they are much more likely to give you the approval to, to, uh, to see the, to, to treat these patients. Um, okay, we, uh, I think we are coming to the end of uh, this webinar. Um, I would like to thank Professor Jorn, Professor Awad, Dr. Aisha, uh, and our organizers and our host, Saudi German Hospital Group. Um, I don't think that we, we have more questions now, so thank you all. And that's all welcome all the same. <laughs> And let's hope to see you soon in Saudi Arabia, both of you. Yes, I'm definitely coming soon. As soon as Thank we you, have Professor Ayman. Thank you, my friend Jordan, and thanks for Dr. Aisha. Hope we'll see Thank you. Thank you.